I want to start by asking a very simple question. Have you ever wondered how can someone always be mentally untroubled by challenges? If you have, then you're wrong, because that's impossible. However, it is important that one strive to achieve this goal. This is why I am here today to introduce to you an ideal that one could work towards for this goal. Now, before we overcome the challenge, we must identify the challenge first. So, I want to burden you with another easy question. What prevents you from being happy? Now, many of you are students, and students like me will enter with studying. To explain this more clearly, I wish to introduce the idea of meritocratic education. Meritocratic education is a system aimed at rewarding students based on their demonstration of merit in an area. What does that mean to us? It means that it provides a singular, um, singular, stark, and standard goal for studying. That is, studying is a method to attain a higher grade. That sounds familiar, right? But hold on. It puts our wide interest to a numeral scale and our diverse personality to an impersonal evaluation. It forces us to make the choice between doing what we enjoy and doing what will bring us the highest grades and put us under the influence of guilt or anxiety. One of the most prominent philosophers in the 19th century, Friedrich Nietzsche, might just have the answer for us when he proposed the idea of the Superman or the Ubermensch. Now, when we first think of the word a Superman, we picture a strong, muscular figure, perhaps with a red underwear, stopping trains single-handedly and bending iron bars like twisting twigs. Indeed, a traditional Superman in this sense is someone who is physically powerful, healthy, and strong. Nietzsche's Ubermensch, however, is a mental version of the traditional Superman, namely someone who is mentally healthy, strong, and powerful. Nietzsche exclusively wrote on this theory, or this vision perhaps, in metaphoric quotes, and he rather elucidates details. There are two paths, however, that might reveal to us the idea of the Ubermensch. The first is from understanding the opposite of the Ubermensch, or the last man. And the second is from understanding Nietzsche's metaphors and quotes he used to describe the Ubermensch. Now, before we continue, I want to warn you of something. That the idea of the Ubermensch was understood very differently throughout history. Haudin Dahl saw it as someone who organized the chaos within. Kaufman saw it as someone who creates his own values. Jung saw it as someone who represents a new god. Heidegger saw it as someone who surpassed himself, and the Nazis saw it as someone who represents their master race. While some are completely misinterpretations of Nietzsche, others are only an aspect of what the Ubermensch actually is, and that is why we'll base our discussion from here on the original quotes from Nietzsche. Basically, um, so first let's talk about the opposite of Ubermensch, the last image, or the last man. There are three most important characteristics of the last image. Of the the first is archetypical, meaning typical throughout history. The second is passive, meaning lack of passion. And the third is nihilistic, believing that the world is ultimately meaningless. Diving deeper, however, there are four main characteristics of the lesson age. The first characteristic is the search for safety and security. As Nietzsche wrote in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, that man is a rope between the animal and the superman, a rope over an abyss. Revealing to us that the path one would have to take to become the Ubermensch is inherently dangerous. And the less image on the other side of this rope is absorbed in the animal needs for safety and security and timid to cross this, according to Nietzsche, dangerous crossing, dangerous wayfaring, dangerous looking back, dangerous trembling and halting. The second characteristic of the less image is the seeking for harmony. As Nietzsche wrote, freedom means that the manly instincts which delight in war and victory dominates over other instincts, for example, those of pleasure. The less image, therefore, seeks in life pleasure and harmony instead of delight and victory. Nietzsche does not approve this because he do not believe that freedom can be achieved passively, but that it requires an active desire with the greatest of power. The people who truly love freedom, quoting Nietzsche, need to treat it as something one has or does not have, something one wants, and something one conquers. The third characteristic of the less image is the yearning for equality. The equality Nietzsche is describing here is the delusion of equality in a society the less image dreams of. Um, Nietzsche believes that this form of equality is horrifying to mankind and explains it as the doctrine of equality, but there is no more venomous poison in existence, for it appears to be preached by justice itself when it's actually the end of justice. Nietzsche explained this by saying the less image uses this equality as a weapon against the strong, against the talented, against the free, and in a general sense, against the ubermensch. The fourth characteristic of the less image is believing in nihilism, or that life is meaningless. In most of his work, Nietzsche argued against the doctrinal Christianity at his time prevailing in Germany. 
At the same time, however, he feared the way that science killed our belief in God will lead to an appalling outcome. That society eventually as a whole would deny that there are any meaning at all and turn to nihilism. As he presented this problem as, God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murder of all murders? In order to compensate for this horror, Nietzsche believes that we will um, ethnotize ourselves in work and in and justic pleasure. I am afraid to say that Nietzsche might be right on this. Ethnotizing work, encouraged by meritocracy and capitalism, and energistic pleasure propelled by the addictive doses of entertainment on TikTok, YouTube, and etc. In summary, the less the image seeks in life, maximum safety and security, desires passive harmony, shrieks for absolute equality, and are nihilistic and ethnotized. As the opposite of the less image, the ubermensch lives in risk, plays with danger, seeks individuality, and creates his own values. Now, let's move on to the second part. Now, let's move on to the second part and see Nietzsche from a great writer's perspective and see the metaphors he wrote around the ubermensch. Firstly, in Nietzsche's biography, Essek Homo, he introduces to us the concept of the Ubermensch and how it originated. That one hears but one does not seek. One takes, one does not ask who gives. A thought flashes up like lightning, it comes of necessity and unfalteringly formed. The Ubermensch could as well be a symbol for Nietzsche to withstand and defy nihilism. As he wrote, Ah, you men within the stone, there sleeps an image for me, the image of all my dreams. Revealing to us that the Ubermensch is like a mental image raised from Nietzsche's unconsciousness and guiding him up towards a new spiritual cosmos. Moreover, the Nietzsche believed that the Superman should have the courage to rebel and flout against a dominating culture. And in this process, he should die proudly when it's no longer possible to, to live proudly. Indeed, Nietzsche supports the, the rebellious attitudes infinitely over the submissive. Stated mentally as, he who cannot obey himself will be commended and intellectually as, extreme positions are not succeeded by moderate ones, but by contrary extreme positions. He likes to describe those of mediocrity, living in the shadow of idols, doctrines, and majorities, as the living dead. And more than anything, he's disgusted by the hypocritical demagoguery of the less image. Now onto the idea of the image in the society. Nietzsche recognizes that the image will be envied and hated by the less image explaining that the higher we soar, the smaller we appear in those who cannot fly. The less image, therefore, in this ongoing and unending historical conflict, seek ways to debilitate the image, creating their own morals to constrain the image, using utility to justify their ignorance, and endorses quantity over quality. Most importantly, the image is an architect of values. He lives as the amor fati, a Latin phrase for love for one's fate, loving his fate completely and wholeheartedly. Therefore, it is no question if becoming the Ubermensch will bring one happiness, for he is a happiness in himself. It is no question if becoming the Ubermensch will bring one optimism, for he is optimism in himself. All values originate in him and ending him. He is the ruler and the ruled. He will not die insofar as dying is his fate, and he is fate itself. Indeed, the Ubermensch in this sense is a being of will, a pure act, and a timeless work. Let us end on this note. Live life bravely like a journey. Never categorize yourself under a doctrine or allow yourself to be lost in nihilism. Create your own values outside of the education of meritocracy or be aware of our inclination towards a less image. Finally, by becoming the image, we can answer the impossible question I posed at the start of this presentation to face challenge without mental distress. I want to end by quoting Nietzsche in the Untimely Meditations. No one can construct for you the bridge which upon you must cross the stream of life. No one but you yourself alone. And we should all become our own Ubermensch. Thank you.